Hello again, everybody. I'm Roger Hoover. Glad to welcome you back to the Crimson Tide Sports Network. And it's time for the big picture. It is presented by Legacy of Hope, Alabama. Saving a life has never been easier. You can register online at LegacyofHope.org to become an organ, eye, and tissue donor. Give the gift of life by becoming an organ donor today. Well, it's Alabama football this week, returning to action against LSU. And we hope to see head coach Nick Saban on the sidelines because for the Iron Bowl, of course, he watched that game from home and really nobody has given us a glimpse into what it was like for Coach Saban at home like ESPN senior writer Chris Lowe as he had a great article on ESPN.com called Coaching the TV and Chris joins us now over the phone and Chris, it's great to talk to you. How's everything going? Well, Roger, it's good to be with you guys and I'm great. Well, it was a great article again earlier this week on ESPN.com just detailing the story of what game day was like for Coach Saban for the Iron Bowl, getting to watch all of it from home. Just what can you tell us about what you learned in talking with Coach along with Miss Terry and Jeff Allen? Well, I mean, it, you know, Nick said it was just so different, so um, unlike anything he'd ever experienced. I mean, he's such a, a, he's such a creature of habit. And, you know, the thing he, lo- he loves most about football is being there with the players and the coaches and being on the field and being in the locker room before the game, after the game, um, coaching, de- developing, teaching, um, making those adjustments. I mean, he likes being right in the middle of it. He's anything but a hands-off CEO. I think that's the part he missed the most, just feeling so detached. And um, I-, I know that uh, you know anybody who's been around Nick Saban knows how passionate he is about football and, and you know, how intense he is. And I think the, the, the funniest thing was just hearing Miss Terry talk about like, hearing him upstairs screaming at the TV and, and yelling and coaching into the TV. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of kidded Nick. I said, you know, so basically you became like Joe Fan who starts yelling at the TV knowing that there's nothing, nothing you can do other than just yell, although nobody hears you. And he's, of course, such a you know creature of habit, as you mentioned earlier, but there was a point where his pregame routine, he was able to follow some things at home, but wasn't there a point where he just decided to get out of the house for a little bit because there wasn't much he could do? You know, actually, that was on <clears throat> Friday before the game. He said he got so stir-crazy that he got in his car and drove around. Just, and I said, where'd you go, Nick? He said, nowhere. I just drove. <laughs> and he said he started to do that on Saturday because, you know, you know 90 minutes before the game, he had to cut off per NCAA rules all communication with staff and players, and you know just sitting there. He said, "I, you know, I, you know, I need to get in the car and, and drive around." So he, instead, he sat there because he had the, he had the live feed of the game set up in addition to the TV broadcast. He said, "I just sat there like the fan in the upper deck watching pregame warmups, just staring at the TV." So I don't think he liked it. In fact, I know he didn't like it, which is and Jeff Allen probably said it best. And, Jeff knows Nick better than anybody because he's been with him all every step of the way since they got there in 07. He says, I think this whole experience to me just assures or reinforces that Nick Saban's going to never quit coaching. Yeah, certainly doesn't want to be at home while big games are going on like this. Uh, you mentioned he was able to have the live feed. He was able to watch CBS as well, and he would have his reactions before Miss Terry had hers. That must have been fascinating to kind of hear some of the back and forth between those two as she was watching a little bit delayed behind him. Yeah, and of course, she was downstairs, you know, because Ms. Terry had to quarantine as well. She was downstairs. Nick was upstairs in his big bonus room, the room they used for recruiting purposes and entertaining recruits and their families. And so, yeah, he had, he was about, I don't know how many seconds ahead of her. And so he, he'd start yelling or say something, and he, he said he'd hear her yelling. And, of course, you know how Nick's such a perfectionist. <laughs> he said, you know, a couple times I wondered, you know, what the hell is she yell- cheering about? You know, because it didn't go exactly the way the play – he wanted to go, but uh, that was um, – I would have loved to have had a camera or just been a, a fly on the wall during that whole experience to watch uh, watch him and, and, and really miss Terry too because the, the give and the take between those two is priceless. You know, if you've ever heard him or heard her tell stories about Nick or Nick tell stories about Miss Terry, it's, uh, it's, it really sort of gives you a peek into their relationship and, and really a peek into Nick's life away from football because he loves his family, loves being around Terry, obviously, and the grandkids and his kid. I thought two of the more poignant moments in talking to him about Saturday was, A, talking about his dad. That's that's the only other time Saturday that he's been with a team and not on the sidelines for a game since his dad passed away in 73 when he was a GA. Only 22 years old was a GA at Kent State under Don James. 
And I thought the other moment was talking about his kids coming by before the game, Nicholas and Kristen. And, you know, neither one of them could come inside. Kristen's got the game day tradition where she always gives her dad a shiny new penny. And, and on this Saturday, she had to sort of slide it under the door and then give him a high five through the window, which, uh, again, sort of gives you a peek into to Nick Saban, you know, the, the side of him that not everybody sees. We're glad those traditions continued. And Chris, after the ball game, he said that he was very pleased with how Alabama was able to handle everything. He said Coach Sark uh, really did a nice job managing the sideline. And there weren't too many, you know, should I go for it on third or should I go for it on fourth down situations? But from when you talked to Coach Saban, did you seem, did you get a feeling like he was pleased with everything that happened from Alabama football's perspective on Saturday? Yeah, he was especially proud of the staff and the players for, for how smoothly it ran and there weren't really a lot of hiccups and just the way everybody, you know how Nick is. I mean, he, he doesn't ever want to use an excuse that, that a disruption or something that it comes about at the last minute, he doesn't want that to be an excuse for, for poor performance or, or not doing things the way he wants them done. I think that's the thing he was the proudest of, that even though he wasn't there on the sidelines, that the staff, you know, pressed the right buttons and did the things that you wanted to do. Uh, and, you know, that the coaching uh, really did everything that he would have done. I think that's the thing, again, that he felt the best about. And I think the other thing in talking with him, he, he feels better now about the way the defense is played. And I don't, I don't think there's any question – although the game has changed and teams are scoring more points, that they weren't playing at a level defensively that he expected them to. But you look at the last few games, and that defense is starting to look the way we're accustomed to Alabama defenses looking. And what you learn as well about Coach Saban watching practice and then the conversations he's been having with one of his analysts, Charlie Strong? <laughs> and that was, again, some of Miss Terry's <laughs> more entertaining <laughs> stories. As she said that she – she sort of had a glimpse or a taste of what was coming on Saturday because she sat there on, on Wednesday and Thursday and listened to Nick upstairs because, you know, Nick was mic'd up. Or not mic'd up. He was on the phone with Charlie Strong, who was sort of his liaison to the rest of the coaches. Again, this was during practice, not the game. And he would sort of watch TV or watch the practice. and He was all set up where he had all these different – viewpoints of practice actually could see better uh, or more things than he would if he were on the practice field and so Charlie was his guy that he would relay things to and Terry as only she could she could says I, I just said poor Charlie because he just kept Nick kept yelling into his earpiece and I finally said you know Nick you're not yelling at the players you're not screaming or, or, or coaching the players all you're doing is yelling into Charlie's earpiece which, which again to hear her say that she's probably about the only one on the planet you can say that to Nick. Uh, but again, it just shows you how involved he is. Even though he's at home and he's watching practice from a monitor, he, he might as well be there on the practice field, part of special teams, watching the DBs, um, watching the specialists. I mean, the only thing that changed, and I think this was his quote, was he wasn't there. Well, we certainly hope that he is there coming up in Baton Rouge on Saturday against LSU. Did he seem pretty confident that he would be able to be back on the sidelines for Saturday? Yeah, he said he's supposed to be out of isolation by Friday, and he said he was feeling really, you know, good. He said he, he had a little bit of a cold, but it never had a fever. You know, didn't have uh, any of the chills or aches that a lot of people get when they get the the COVID. And uh, you know, his oxygen level was good. So he said he never really, other than a little bit of a runny nose and a little bit of a cold, uh, that he never had some of the more severe effects thankfully, that a lot of people do get. But, no, he expects to be back, and and it's, I'd say that's bad news for everybody else because, you know, him being a, a, away from the game and not have a chance to be there, just how much more he's, he's ready to be back on the sideline this weekend. Well, Chris, as you've been watching college football this year, just what impresses you the most about this Alabama football team, and is this one of the better teams that Coach Saban has had in recent years? Well, without question, the most explosive or, or one of the more explosive offensive teams we've seen. And and I, the thing I like best about them offensively is, you know, yeah, they've got Devontae Smith. And of course, Waddle's not there now. And Mechie and Mac Jones is having a Heisman ass type of year. And they can spread you out through the football down the field. But they can still line up and bloody your nose with Najee Harris in that running game. 
an offensive line that's as good as we've seen. I mean, you've got three or four guys in offensive line who are going to play in the NFL. So if they need to grind the game out, I think they're certainly still equipped to do so offensively. And as I said a minute ago, they're playing better and more like we're used to seeing out of mountain play on defense. Uh, I, uh, I like the leadership on this team. I like the way that, again, it's been such a challenging year for everybody across college football, and yet this team hasn't really seemed to blink. They played well, and it hasn't really mattered who they played. You know, Coach Saban talks about the outer school board and the inner score board, and I think this team's sort of been a testament to the fact that the inner score board has been a whole heck of a lot more important than the outer scoreboard. Well, Chris, we'll start to wrap things up with this. We call this the big picture because it's a national view of Alabama football. And, of course, you cover college football for ESPN as a senior writer. Just what are some of the storylines that intrigue you the most as we continue going along over the next few weeks trying to get closer to the college football playoff? What are you keeping an eye on? I think two in particular. I think one, the Big Ten. You know, are, are the teams in the Big Ten going to be able to play enough games uh, i.e. Ohio State, to, to be considered, I mean, A, to be eligible to play in the Big Ten Championship game, and B, to be considered for the playoff. You know, and that, that's, I think that's something that everybody around college football is watching. And I think everybody, and, and Nick told me this back before the season, when it looked like the Big Ten may not play and then decided to play, that he was happy. that We want the playoff to be as representative as it possibly can of all the college football. So you want to see a Big Ten team. Be eligible. Well, I think the second thing is, if the Big Ten doesn't get in the playoff, how many SEC teams can get in? You know, would we see a, a scenario where two or even three got in, depending on who wins and who loses the conference championship games? I think those are the things. You know, A&M sort of working out there. You know, if they went out, their only loss would be to to Alabama. What happens with Florida? Florida would have beat Alabama let's say, in the championship game, SEC championship game, would they both get in, Bama and Florida? So I think the how many SEC teams get in and what happens in the Big Ten the rest of the way are the two things that I'll probably be keeping my eye on. Well, Chris, we'll read your work at ESPN.com. And again, you did a great job earlier this week with coaching the TV and inside look at Coach Saban watching the Iron Bowl from home. But thank you for joining us on the network today, and we look forward to seeing you again down the road. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, that was Chris Lowe of ESPN. Thank you for watching the Crimson Tide Sports Network.